Welcome back to another episode of The Hip. My name is James Layton, CEO and founder of Anderson James. This is the podcast where every single week I bring you a leader from our sector to discuss some of the biggest challenges in UK housing today. Today it was great to be joined on the podcast by Matt Forrest, Chief Executive of 13 Group. We talk about Matt's journey into housing, how he started life as a geography teacher, then had a great career in the private sector before joining our fantastic housing sector seven or eight years ago, and how seven months ago he took the chief executive role at 13 Group. We also talk about the fantastic commitment they've made in investing over £300 million into their homes over the next five years, how getting culture right and is integral to success in any organisation, the Substantial Homes England grant that they've secured to make sure that they continue on their journey to deliver new homes, and what Matt hopes for the future for the organisation, but also the legacy they want to leave in the region. I hope you liked the episode, and if you do, I'd ask that you like and subscribe. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm excited for this one. Um, As as I always like to start, do you mind just by giving us an introduction to yourself for the listeners, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, Well, I'm Matt Forrest. I've been at 13. I'm seven months into the role, so I'm kind of, I've lost the new boy thing now. (laughs) I'm past past that point. And um, yeah, I've been in the Northeast for about 30 years and had a bit of a a range of experiences on the way into housing, which uh, has kind of led to me taking up a chief exec role. Love that. I was going to talk about this because you have had a fascinating background, as I know, but just talk us through your journey into housing because it's quite a, it's quite a unique one, I think. Yeah, yeah, it kind of wasn't planned, but I don't think that's unusual in housing, is it? So no. I, I left university, went to university in Sheffield, left university and I didn't have a plan. My wife had a plan. She came, returned to the North East, who's my girlfriend at the time, and trained to be a teacher. And as it happened, her mother was a teacher, she was a teacher, my father was a teacher. Oh. So the following year, I just I, I became a teacher. It was almost you know, it, just, it seemed a very natural thing to do, and then taught for four years, enjoyed it, loved the journey, enjoyed the kids, had great great fun. I still got great mates from that time in my career, but in that fourth year of teaching, my my mother had a brain tumor, and she was poorly for a year and passed away at the end of the year. And I had this kind of revelation of like you you know got to go and do things that you want to do. And then inexplicably, the thing that I decided to do was become an accountant. I tried wow. <laughs> so I qualified as an accountant with KPMG. And when I got there, I was really surprised to realise that people actually spent their time preparing accounts. And that was a job. And that was a job of an accountant. So I wasn't all that well versed in you know what I was going into. But I just had this kind of view that it would lead to something. And it was a businessy type thing. And I had no concept of what people did in business really because my background wasn't anything like that. So I sort of did, I passed all the exams and I went into corporate recovery. So, you know, with leaderships and administrations running, uh, you know, it was like bakeries that were shutting down and getting <laughs> the bakery and all that kind of stuff. And it was great, it was great fun, but it was much more commercial. And that then took me into M&A, so mergers and acquisitions, okay. which I did for, you know, a little while as well. And then that, it led into more commercial roles, running business units at Sage Software, FTSE 100 software company headquartered in the Northeast. And I was there for about 12 years and ended up doing sort of strategy roles, commercial roles, marketing roles, product marketing roles, until eventually the roles got very specialised. We had a bit of a shift in the way that we were organised. And, I, you know, as you can tell from my background, I, I know very little about anything, but a bit of a generalist. And the roles became very product marketing and really focused. And I took redundancy because that wasn't me. I, you know, just that just wasn't yeah. how I, I thought and operated. And then I was looking for a role in the the northeast, a big organisation. And one came up as I think it was business exec director of business development at Home Group. Right. At that point, I didn't really know what housing association was. And honestly, <laughs> this is like six or seven years ago, seven years ago, and um, got that role. Did it, enjoyed it, and then moved, had a sideways move into the operations role. So running 55,000 properties, nine maintenance contracts, creating a DLO, um, housing management, 300 yeah, all of it. supported services, all of that stuff, you know, all the operational stuff. And, um, you know, at that point, once you've done that, 
you kind of that's housing isn't it right you you, you, you're deep into it and then you know i i and there was never one of these people who started off in the career and said you know at 25 i you know i want to be a ceo i've always just done the next interesting thing and the next challenge and the, the, the thing that would take me on a bit and when I did that big operational role at Home Group, I was very conscious that the two things I needed if I wanted to move on, and those two things were being able to sort of hand on heart say, I've led large numbers of people. So yeah. that's the people skills bit. And then a bit more board experience. And those those two bits. And I and I over the over that sort of course for a few years, sort of built up that experience and, and got that in the in the wheelhouse they call it now, don't they? That was in my now yeah, wheelhouse. wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. No one ever had a wheelhouse twenty years ago, but we've all got a wheelhouse now. And um, so it just felt like it was the time, you know. But you sort of you think, well, I'm, I'm sort of ready for something. And this thirteen role came up, and I had a good chat with the chair, and there was a bit of chemistry. And thought, well, actually, I get on with the chair. I knew Teesside a little bit because I lived down there, I taught down there. Um, yeah. So as I've as we've discussed, just prior to the podcast bizarrely i taught geography to one of the hr team and one of the finance team is married to uh, a gentleman who was in my first form tutor group wow. <laughs> when I was a <laughs> so i had a bit of an affinity with teesside um got on well with the chair took a look at the organization and i just felt like for me this was the time and over, over my sort of long and varied career, whether it's accountancy, people skills, operational stuff, I, I built up the, the, the kit bag that I needed to be a CEO. And, you know, I was never desperate to do the role, but just felt like ready for the next thing. The next thing naturally felt like that CEO role. CEO role. Love that. And it's, it's an interesting journey, that. I think what, what, what have been some of the important things that you learn outside a sector that have helped you now, would you say, in terms of the chief exec role? Because I'm always really interested and intrigued as to how we can bring more of that into our sector through a leadership yeah. route. I, I think there's, there's two things. So one's more people orientated, one's a bit more um, business orientated. So the first one, I would say when I was at Sage, this is going back years, they put a lot of investment at a point in time into leadership, leadership skills, management skills, culture. And mm. when I look around, there was a group of us, about 12, who were really lucky to get onto this sort of leadership program um, and a really real, real investment in us as people. Everybody's kicked on, right? They've all done good things with their careers. And I think that that focus on culture, and we'll probably talk about it a bit, bit later on. Definitely, in, yeah. In the podcast, really important because you get an awful lot out of that spend money and there's a there's a big return and the other thing is uh, i think people are kind of a bit wary of the private sector it's been the public sector or third sector people are a bit wary of all they've got a bit of a commercial background i'm not sure they'll get it you know that that kind of thing and uh, we you know I'm not sure they get the customer focus and so on but when i was at sage there was a big program and it, it was around net promoter and it's a bit old it's a bit sort of out of fashion now it's not quite as fashionable as it, as it was back then but we looked across the globe at all our businesses and all the product lines and we we measured net promoter. It was something really focused on. And it was very clear that the most successful products and services were the ones with the highest net promoter score. So you really focus as a result of that on how do you make the customers happy? How do you find out what they need? And how do you deliver on um that kind of expectation of the customer? And if you if you delivered on that, you would make money. There was a direct relationship to it. And this, by the way, this, this is an organization where Puts you 100, so you like quarterly, quarterly sales results, half year sales results, year end sales yeah, of course. results. You know, it was a very commercial environment, but very customer focused as well. And I think translating that into housing and bringing that and saying, okay, well, what's it like when you walk in the door? When you walk in the door of one of our homes, is it good enough? Would you want to live there? You know, what, how can we make this better? You know, and it's, that's a little bit like the unboxing of an iPhone, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really is. Yeah. It's our equipment, you know. Someone walks in and goes, no carpets, you know, plasters falling off the walls, all looks a bit crap. What what does that say? You know, so I think we have to think more about that in housing, about what what's that customer experience like. Yeah, no, I love that. And the MPS thing is is still pretty, pretty fundamental, but it used to be massive, didn't it? But yeah. how does that liken to the customer satisfaction stuff that we do in the sector? It, is it good enough? Do we get enough raw data to make those decisions as you did with the MPS? Well, in, in my experience of you know, the the housing association I've worked in, which is a you know grand total of two, 
I think, yes, we do get that data. And I think there's a good focus on that data. And there are people in in organisations. And I think in 13 and in home, I can think that people come from outside the sector and they bring all that experience in. And, you know, people have sort of moved on. They know that having a customer satisfaction measure that says you're always on 92% isn't a true yeah, of course. It's a true story, right? So I think that the data is there, and I, but I think where we have to increasingly focus on is what do you do with that and how do you close the loop? Of course, as you know, always in these things. <laughs> and it's just like, how do you keep how do you keep getting better? What what's that experience? How do you make it better? And how do you how do you go back to customers and say, you said this, we've done this, and it's and the difference being noticeable. And yeah, no, I love that. And, and you probably answered this already, but I suppose what was the one or two things that really enticed you towards 13? Um, Group as a role, but also as I suppose, it felt, feels like the next logical step in your career. So I get that part. But what was the, some of the key things that enticed you to the business? Yeah, I, well, you, you only can look at a business from the outside, can't you? And of course you can. You, <laughs> you, you, never, you never quite knew. I mean, I knew, I knew it a bit by reputation because obviously I've been in the sector in the Northeast for a period of time. But I think a couple of things that really enticed me to 13 were I, I i like its geographical focus yeah so we've got a lot on t side we're a little bit spread so we, we've got some growth areas that we, we're working on so that's important it's important to have some 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 different outlets for growth but i love that and i still i still do i love the fact that um you know if there's an issue i say look so where, where, what's, where, where's this problem and so someone will say oh it's just like literally 10 minutes that way I go oh, i'll jump in the car yeah, absolutely. That is good, and I and I and I do I do love that. Um, and and then I think that Thirteen's always been a very progressive organisation. It's relatively new, so it's got a short history, but it's been quite progressive. So, you know, you there from an external point of view, you sort of think, oh, this is quite an interesting thing to get involved in. You know, so so for me, it's probably those two things. Love the geography, and as I said, a bit of history in the area, so a bit of you know, a bit of a connection with the area, and then that notion that oh, actually we're we're going places. We want to go places. Yeah, I love that. And I think you said that you've built up, and it sounds like you have the toolkit to do the job. What what have been some of the things in your first seven months? Appreciate it's a short period of time, but I bet it's been a baptism fire. What are some of the things you've had to quickly get to grips with that you didn't have that you thought you might? Yeah, well, I, I think the, the thing that's, and this is true for everyone, I say this, you know, mm-hmm. go around the building. So, like, when you walk in as a chief exec, you still don't know where the printers are. That's so true. And, you, you know, you... <laughs> You still don't know how to get anything. You know less how to get anything done than anyone else in the building. So you don't know anyone. So I think the the, the thing that you've I've had to sort of work on getting up to speed with is getting to know people. Yep. Where do people fit? How's how's it organised? And it's not things aren't ever, ever quite organised the way you think they might be because everyone has their own little oh. way of doing, doing things, don't they? So structurally and so on. So you never quite know what role does what. So getting to know people and that that feeling. And the other piece is, and I would include in that the external stakeholders. So you know we work very closely with our local councils, the Tees Valley Combined Authority, and so on. So making those connections with people. So actually embedding myself in that has been an effort. And then the other the other piece I think is getting to know the areas in the estates. Yeah. So that locality thing and being able, you know, I was with um, the new Middlesbrough mayor and being able to sit down in a room with someone who's who's like Middlesbrough born and bred and be able to have those conversations and say, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I've been to that area. We, yeah, of course. You know, I, I've met our team on the, and, and doing that. And I think getting that, those two pieces, it's the people and then because housing is a particular thing, getting to know the places as well and getting up to speed on those. And I think, but technically, you know, fine you know it's a housing yeah. association runs pretty well nothing to panic about so it's those two things i think where the energy and effort goes it's a different level to come into right as well like you've got everyone looking up at you to say all right what's next what's the next journey yeah. and, and you're trying to familiarize yourself with the settings and the landscape a little bit um in terms of the northeast specifically i suppose because you talked about geography quite a lot there <laughs> as a teacher but also in terms of the 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 13 stock what what have you seen change in the 30 years that you've lived in the northeast in terms of the housing landscape what have been some of the fundamental things you've seen change in that period yeah that's an interesting one because i guess the first you know 25 or so of those years i wasn't in housing so i've got a lay person's understanding of it i think there's a great um there's there's a great photo of margaret thatcher and her walk in the wilderness and it's really famous 
it's and it's it's in Middlesbrough, so it's right. industrial wasteland. You know, she's she's there with a handbag, her head slightly bowed. Really famous photo. It's it's, it's a bit a little bit over thirty years old, right. and I think then to now that's part of the story of of the northeast and it's Middlesbrough, Newcastle, Sunderland. There's been a lot of that change from industrial wasteland and decline to some really exciting developments. So all the boho developments in Newcastle you know, by the river there sprung up. They're really exciting. There's tech businesses. There's you know we've got housing there. It's the same in Newcastle on the quayside and so on. So you've got you've got this element of regeneration and and growth, which is brilliant. Yep. But but I think against that, the other the other point is that everything is thirty years older, <laughs> yeah. right? So all those properties that were built in the nineteen fifties are now thirty years older. So they're eighty years old, not 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 fifty years old. And I think that's a big difference. So. When I came into housing, there was a massive focus uh, on growth and building and development. And I remember going to meetings and lots of the chief execs in the Northeast were saying, well, hang on, right? We can give you net additional properties, but really we need to do some regeneration because you should you should come to Middlesbrough, you should come to Harpers Hill in Newcastle, you should come to these places and see the state of the properties. We need to do some regeneration. And the conversation was like, no, 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 no. It needs to be net additional. And I think that's the other part of it, that actually there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I mean, invest, investing in existing properties, demolishing some. 13 does a good job of that with the tower blocks. We've, we've really moved, moved some, some on and, and yeah. developed those, those blocks. So it's something about actually it, the, the landscape is there's some great, exciting stuff, and we've moved on from the wilderness years, but there's also real challenges with the existing property stock, which are now... As we all know, with damp and mold, etc., are coming home to roost. Yeah, it's it's a shame. I mean, just to take it a step to the present day, just give us a, a, a helicopter overview of thirteen as we sit here today. I obviously know this, but just for the listeners, just paint the picture of thirteen as a business. Yeah, so thirteen are a, I guess, sort of medium largest housing association, thirty five thousand properties. Um, the the core of what our properties are in: Stockton, Middlesbrough, Hartlepool. And then a bit outside that in the northeast, and we're growing into Kirklees and Humberside as well. So you know, cool. reasonable concentration, and then a bit of a bit of spread as well. We deliver some support services like employability. We do a great job in yeah. employability. We uh, help 500 people a year into employment, which is great for the area. Uh, we do some Ministry of Justice contracts, do a bit of homelessness type stuff. Yeah, so that, those kind of wraparound support services as well. We've got about 1,500 people. We deliver our own, mostly our own maintenance. So uh, it's, a D, it's a DLO, but we contract out bits where we need to. We, that might be bigger works or it might be extra capacity. And we're a developing housing association. So um, this year we'll do our biggest year ever. Uh, we'll do about 650 properties. So... Wow. De decent development program, strategic partner of Homes England. We've completed wave one, tick, and we're on that kind of wave yeah. two now. Get on, get on with wave two. So that, I mean, that's us in, in a nutshell. And I, I guess I was talking about the people. I'd say great people, really passionate. You know, mm -hmm. and what one of the things I took away from all my initial roundtables and conversations going on site was we we've got a team. We call it Team Thirteen who are, are bothered right they're passionate love that they uh really love that. yeah i'll be rude now but they give a shit that's what we say yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I know. And, and that's so important i mean it's very important and look like we, we sometimes go too far with this stuff but that's the basics right like people care right that, that yeah. is the basics that we need to get right um I mean, brave of you to step into a chief exec role in the current climate. I mean, in terms of, I don't think I can think of a time in my career, certainly there'd been a more difficult time to be a chief exec. Cost of living crisis, uh, carbon, net zero carbon, the, um, all the stuff around housing crisis, developing new homes. There's so much going on and there's so much bad press, the damp and mold as we talked about previously. What are you doing at 13 and currently involved in that's making you proud right now? Because I've had David Ripple on the podcast and I love the story of, of what 13 are doing, but what are some of the things you're really proud of and most proud of? Yeah, it, good good question. So we 
talk about the development program mm -hmm. that's strong we're delivering it we're committed to it and i think one of the things i'm proud of there is that despite all those other cha challenges the board have held firm mm -hmm. that we want to keep doing this it'd be easy to say right stop. of course okay um our repair service is strong we do 140,000 repairs a year oh. so we, we we churn out the repairs um we had six complaints go to the housing ombudsman survey service last year no findings of maladministration so when i look at those two so that actually that that volume and that kind of return is great cost us two hundred thousand pounds by the way which is an awful lot of money to have of course six cases but good good service and a focus on that service so you know we've looked at it and said right can we what can we do better how can we keep improving how do we keep going and one of the things related to that i'm really proud of is we've moved to area-based delivery to get closer to the local communities and we're folding more bits of the business into it so our grounds are going into it, our repairs are into it, our cleaners will go into it we're going to put our investment works into those area-based teams so you sort of get you're going to see the same people around the doors love that. and those people should know each other better yeah that's the way yeah. and, and uh, so doing some really good work there and and then i think generally our our attitude that progressive attitude that I've talked about sort of permeates the business. So everybody wants to get on and do a better job. And while that's not a thing that you can point at, it is, it is, it is very powerful. Yeah, no, I, I, I really like that. And Dave Ripley talked about that quite a lot in detail. And I think it's great. The hubs, everything that you're doing seems to be really customer centric at the moment, which is bro. Um, you've made a massive commitment. I think I read, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, but 300 million pounds across your property portfolio, 25,000 units, I think it said in the next five years. How important is that going to be for the local communities? Like you said, it's the unboxing of the iPhone, right? But how important is that going to be in the local community? Would you say? Yeah, I think, well, I think it's very important. So the first thing is, you know, for not say take, take that step away from the community, but for the individual, it's important mm. they feel their home's being invested in. Of course. You know, and I and I think those big numbers are important for us to point out and say, look, actually, it's a million pounds a week. Wow. It's a million pounds. So you're spending a million pounds a week and it's on kitchens, bathrooms, windows, and so on. Yeah. Retrofit will sit on top of that, by the way. Okay. So, so retrofit will be in addition to that. And then we spend about 16 million quid a year on repairs. So these are big sums and even when you divide it down by thirty five thousand homes it turns into a reasonable number the, the 300 million is for twenty five thousand houses because that's where they come around in the cycle so 12 12 and a half thousand pounds on a house that's a good amount of money to spend on a house in a five-year period so they'll be, be in good nick but what you also see is that great community engagement so we'll go around and say right what, what bathroom do you want what kitchen do you want how do you like this to look and I think that that brings a bit of pride for the individual, but then for the community. And as we do the work, it's a great opportunity for us to get the gazebo up and get people out talking to us and engaging with us. So all of that helps with our communities. Now, one of the questions I think we've got is, are we spending that 300 billion in the right places? So we're looking at the resource and the tools that we've got in our asset team to see if we can boost that up a bit, because a lot of that 300 million this will be the same for many housing associations is driven by the decent home standard and replacement of components okay and i think we need to take a bit of a step back and say right whole house what do you need to do is this stuff as as well as this or instead of are we doing it all in the right order is, is there, are there better ways of spending that money because there are huge amounts of money so we're putting a bit more resource and investment into our asset team really focus on data really focus on systems and and really focus on planning because yeah. i suspect that we can get more value by putting a bit more up front out of that 300 million that we, that we would get if we just rolled out the program as, as the sort of as we turn it out now yeah and have we got better as a sector i know you've only been in it a relatively short period but from your opinion data is everything right when you're at sage i'm presuming data drove, drove every decision you made right but in the housing sector is our data accurate enough for our housing stock to make the right decisions around investment or how do we get to a point where we really are just following the data for all of our decision making well, I guess the first thing is you'd be surprised and you know, you've worked in other businesses. Most businesses have a lot of spreadsheets kicking around. So yeah, exactly. You know, yes, they, 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 so, so do we here. <laughs> so, you know, I think people look outside their own business and think, oh, yeah, we've got all this stuff on spreadsheets. And that's kind of how the world works to a certain extent. Exactly. No, it is. 
I, so I think we've got I think we've got good data. Most people have good data, and you know I would imagine most of us have the kind of five year cycle going on with the stock condition survey and so on. Mm-hmm. And now I think the the next challenge is to say, how do you improve that data? How do you make sure it's more up to date? How do you leverage um, the fact that you have somebody? Well, I have somebody going doing a gas check, twenty eight thousand properties, fire smoke alarm checks, fire door checks. How do you leverage all of that to get a bit more data and a bit more up to date? at any point in time. Most houses will have a repair, so can we get any more data out of that? And then I think there's questions about, in the future, this is going forward a little bit, what what tech is useful? So we're using Switchy. We've got a trial going on there, and their sensors will help us know what temperature homes are at, whether heating's being used. You know, and if you could if you could know what humidity was. Absolutely. All, all of that, you can imagine 35,000 homes, if all, if all of that was coming into head office, and you had the data and you could play with the data, you could always say, actually, look, these five, get out and knock on the door because we're going to have damp problems there. Let's find out what's going on. And I, so I all, Clever. well, the same, same with you, why shouldn't you know when the boiler is about to break down? Yeah. Because it's all, all that tech is there in other sectors. And if we could piece it all together, I think that turns into a really exciting way of thinking about the data, the data that we have on a property and what we can do proactively and predictively to understand that now that that probably takes years to get there but i think we have to start with that mindset that this is all possible well it is all possible we know that don't we right yeah. so modern technology is there it's just how we ad- adapt it to our properties um one thing that i've always wanted to ask it's probably a layman terms question this but where everyone's having to invest in their stock you're a big organization so i can see that there's going to be a pot of money from rents and all the other stocks, but with everyone being squeezed financially from an accountant's perspective, how do we fund all of these things? Like, I, like physically, how are we going to be able to fund all of the different stuff that we want to do to make sure it all, it all happens, <laughs> decent homes, cost of living, new build, all the things we're being driven to do. How can we make that stack up on a, on a balance sheet? So, you know, we, we've already got very limited sources of funding, haven't we? Yeah, of course. We've got rents. You could do some commercial activity. I, I'm always a bit dubious about how effective housing associations are but with their commercial activity. A- absolutely. But fundamentally, you rent, you've got grants in whatever form from the government, and you've got borrowings, hmm. right? So they're, they're your three pots of money that you can draw on. And you know, I think we can make a certain amount happen within the envelopes that we've got now in terms of that funding. Yeah. And then there has to be some compelling conversations with government to say, right, if we want this to happen, then it costs this. You know, yeah. and I, I talked to you about when I came into the sector six or seven years ago, and it was the whole conversation was net new. You've got to build build new. Yeah. There was also rent freeze, wasn't there? So you had this kind of right, everyone be more efficient with that core business, build new new properties. And the outcome was we focused on new properties and people didn't look at the core quite as much. And now six yeah. or seven years later, we're saying we need to look at the core. And I think what we have to do as a sector is make the compelling argument. Say, look, if you want retrofit and you want X number of properties a year from a development perspective, and you want all the properties to be a you know, decent home, future home standard, whatever that standard is going to be, there's probably a price tag associated with it. You know, yeah. you know and I think that, that's, a, that's a realistic conversation. But equally, we have to spend the money that we've got wisely, you know, think about how we how we can mm. Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, thanks for that. And um, Culture, talk about it every episode. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm obsessed with culture. How integral is it in an organization, organization's success? I know we talked off camera. I get quite a lot of feedback where people say it shouldn't be investing in that, it should be investing in our homes. I don't agree. Uh, um, and, and that's mainly because I think if we can get our culture out of our organizations, like you said, and people do care to do a good job, that will only pay dividends in the future. But what's your view on, on culture and how integral it is? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I said a little bit about culture before, didn't I, from my yeah. pre- previous lives. But no, I think culture is incredibly important. And there's, I think it's a Peter Drucker quote, isn't it, which is culture beats strategy every time. You know, yeah, if, absolutely. You, if you get the culture right, if you get the people right, you can put them on the bus and they'll drive the bus in the right direction. Yeah. You don't have to work out all the answers. And I very much believe in that. So we we are we're part of my one of my priorities at this point in time, working with the team, is that we, we're going to have a culture program. We're going to re- look at our culture and reinvent ourselves. Yeah. Not because it's, it's damaged and, and wrong and we've got bad bad things happening, but actually we need to think about 
what's the culture you want in five years' time, in 10 years' time? It Absolutely. takes a long time to build that through. It does. And for me, there's a couple of elements. So what is the customer focus? So getting that customer focus really built in. And then the second bit is around the, the delegated authority and the empowerment to act. And we have lots of lots of processes and you know lines of defense and all that good stuff that happens that says, oh, well, you know, you sorry, you can't sign that off because it's like 500 quid. You know, pat- patently, this thing needs to happen. It needs to happen now. So can we delegate those authorities down and get people making the right decisions for our customers? So I think if we get those couple of things right, there'll be lots more in our culture program, I'm sure. Those things right, that that will help fix the customer piece. And then, you know, in any organization working at the how do we make the connections, the collaborations, the teamwork, that kind of feeling that we're all we're all on a mission together yep. and get that bit of the culture working. Because if we get that right, the rest of it will look after itself, actually. No one would ever walk into a damn property and say, well, this is all right. You know, yeah. That would never happen. You'd go, you know, well, I'm customer focused here. This is wrong. We need it fixed. And by the way, I can sign this thing off now. I'll get that thing signed off now. Let's make it happen. Yeah, and look, and, and the, the opposite of that, the cause and effect, right, is is that someone goes into that property, turns a blind eye because they're not happy in the role they're doing and they're not fulfilled and empowered to do their job to the right standard. Yeah. So um, I, I know we've talked about this, so I just don't I just want to touch on it, but I know you've had a substantial um, grant from Homes England. What, what's that going to mean for what you can do in the local area? And I suppose... How important is it to have sensible growth in the new build sector area of the business right now? And, and how are you going to make sure you have the maximum impact in the areas you do build? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Right? So we have talked about good growth. We've, we've got this phrase, good growth. Right. And you know, um, what that means for us is you know, when we're at our best as an organization, we bring the whole suite of services. You know, you've got investment there. You, you've got the repairs team there. You'll have our community team on the ground, you know, and there might be an issue, right? So I was at the estate yeah. the other day and we've got this property where the kids keep ripping the fence down and they burn the fence in the underpass. Wow. Right? Because that's that's what you do for kids. So, you know, we, we've got to work with the council to get the underpass closed off. So that's not there. We've got to, the investment team got to get the fence up. They've got it and then they put the metal fence up and then they, you know, double yeah. it and wire it, make sure you can't rip it down again. And then the community team are there and they're they're getting the boxing club open down the road. And then the ASB team are based on the estate because they they work in a medical center with the police, with the council, and our people, all on the case. And when we're at our best, we bring all of that to our customers. So for us, development has to has to have critical mass i don't want to be spread i want us to be focused on certain growth areas we've got three Absolutely. growth areas where we can get mass and we can offer all of that service to our customers wherever you are and that's what that's how we have the biggest possible impact so mix it all together and also thinking smartly about what we want to build as well so you know what do customers want they want their own front door do we, do we want to be managing tower blocks probably not you know so thinking carefully about what it is that we build not just saying build anything anywhere because it's numbers no 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 we're going to build the right thing in the right place yeah yeah with community at the center um, and and one thing that we talked about off offline and, and and i'm keen to pick up is you've always talked about being fit for the future as an organization with regards to kind of ai and automize and automation and i think david touched on this actually in his, in his episode but how do you believe this will complement the human element? Because I know there's a lot of people worried and a lot of tenants write into the pod and stuff and say, is it going to take away the human element of housing? And is it going to take away the way that we deliver outstanding service? Where, where do you sit on all of this at the moment? Uh, well, look, I, I, our view is that it has to augment the human element of housing, right? Yeah. So where we're so we're investing, for example, in our touch point stores. So these are high street stores. You can come in, you've got any kind of housing problem, yeah. You can just walk, walk in through. So we're one in Stockton, one in Middlesbrough, one in Hull. We'll open one in Hartlepool soon. Yeah. And, and then the next thing on the list is let's get let's get a bus. Love so, that. We can, <laughs> so we can go out and see people. So so we've got to have that human contact with people. People are going to want to pick up the phone. They want to see us face to face. But we we changed ten thousand direct debits manually for renting. Wow. Cases. And what I would say is if we automate that, that gives us more capacity for the front line. So you wouldn't necessarily strip strip people out because 
you say 10,000 lots of three minutes. But all those people are less distracted. And then I think the, the piece around, you know, we touched on Internet of Things, you mentioned AI, there is automation. I I think what happens next on that over the next five years is anyone's guess. So my argument, my argument is that you just need to be strategically ready. And what, so one of the things we're doing is we're recruiting a chief technology and information officer to sit on the senior team because I think technology becomes that, big, that bigger part of our thinking. And then we have to upskill. We have to have the right skills and get ourselves ready with the right people and that, that fit for the future capability on the resource side that says, right, actually, this AI thing could do this for us, and that means... You know, and I don't know what the answers are. I don't. I don't know what what it's, it could do. Anything, isn't it? It could do. You know, probably do this podcast in five years' time. And yeah, yeah, I could uh, synthesize could your now. voice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah ChatGPT could probably have done this for me. But <laughs> you know, so it's going to go somewhere, isn't it? We need to be ready and engage in that conversation. But if you if you go back to our previous conversation about culture and customer focus, if you deploy it with that level of customer and culture, cu- customer focus you're going to come to the right outcome if you look at it and say oh this is all about efficiency then the answer will be that the customers end up with a worse service yeah absolutely and i think look the i've listened to an awful podcast the other day which was quite scary about ai and how quickly it's moving but actually we don't know what's coming so it's pointless predicting that i think um but I, one thing i do think is it's not going to take away that human connection piece which is one thing that i, I don't think it's going to be able to fix so i do believe the human connection is always going to be really important in teams culture collaboration customers there's always going to be need for that um yeah. but a couple of last things just as we finish so i always ask this question but really keen from your perspective because you've not been in housing as long as, as some of the others that i speak to is what would be some of your advice you'd give to some of the future leaders in our sector or people coming into our sector because We're going to need to create new leaders, that's for sure. And I'm a massive advocate at the moment. We need diversity in thinking, diversity in all things, but certainly diversity in thinking from other sectors as well. So I think if you, you know, if you're in the sector, I think that range of experience is really useful, particularly if you want to get, you want to be in a CEO type role. You know, I I would, as I said at the beginning, a little bit telling to you, I'm an expert in nothing, (laughs) but I can read a balance sheet. I can have a conversation with the, CFO and understand what's happening. I've got a little bit of idea about technology, about people and so on. So a, a whole range of experience. And I think people progress quite often in fairly linear careers. Yeah, you know, so I've gone, I'm, you know, an asset manager, head of asset, I'll be an asset director. Yeah, exec director. You know, yeah, yeah. Exec director of asset, you know, does that equip you to a broader role in the next step? Maybe, gotcha. maybe, maybe, maybe not. And I think that's that's something for people to think about. And I've heard this term "squiggly careers," and apparently mine is mine is a squiggly career, right? Because you go <laughs> all over the place. But those sideways moves are really valuable for people because you move sideways. And, oh God, I've got a different even within your own organisation. So, search yeah. out those experiences would be would be um, my my advice. And then for people outside the sector, you know, I think coming into the sector is entirely doable. So I'd say to people from outside the sector, come in, you know, bring your experience in and don't be afraid to get stuck into it. But, you know, there's hard yards to learn any any particular vertical you go into. There's hard yards to learn. But I would say to anyone outside the sector, it's an exciting sector. There's lots going on. You've got this kind of interesting dynamic where you've, you've got this big rent roll. So although we, we gnash our teeth and say everything's terrible and Actually, yeah, of course. compared to a business that starts with no pounds on day one of the year and has to build up a sales pipeline when you've got a rent roll that varies more by a few percent if it's going badly you're actually pretty secure and from that point of view it's a good it's a good sector to be in and there's exciting stuff happening and i you know the house has been a house for a long time hasn't it and i think there's we're just at this point where with mmc technology and you know different types of thinking people can we could do some interesting and exciting things yeah, and look, the, the the things that people are asking for are different now. People used to ask for money, progression, blah, blah. we're seeing planet, community, like like people want different things from their career now. And we can serve that because sustainability is going to be a massive part of what we do. I mean, housing contributes to a lot of carbon, uh, carbon doesn't it? So clearly we're in the slipstream of being a, a facilitator of change in that world, definitely. Yeah, well, I had a great realisation. We had a big argument in our house about whether we should mow the grass in in May, you know, it's like this no mow May thing. Yeah, yeah. I said, like, don't mow the grass. We need the bees. You know, we've got to, you know, we've got to look after everything. We no mow May, 
So we mowed half the grass. That was the compromise. So you think about that's a little impact, a little positive impact. What if you can do that across 35,000 properties? Yeah. Such a we point. have we we have a million square meters of grass we cut 16 times a year. We have <laughs> we have 12 kilometers of hedgerows with all the species in it, <laughs> 6,000 trees. You know, you, when you think about that, one of the things I talk about is is that kind of diversity and the impact you can have on that is massive. So if, if that's a driver, and it is for a lot of people, you know, we've got a lot of people really engaged in that agenda at 13, then housing is a great place to be because you're impacting the environment on a day-to-day basis. A hundred percent. And it's a massive, massive thing that most people, especially like the next generation of talent are talking about. That's what they want to do. And that's where they want to be. So I think it's a good thing. Um, as we finish, last thing for me, what do you want your legacy to be in housing when you look back on your career, um, whatever that may be? And, and also, what are you excited about? And what do you want the vision and the next five or six years to look like for 13? Appreciate that's quite a blue sky thinking ask question, but keen to understand what your thoughts are. It's a big question, isn't it? 13 houses about seventy three thousand people right yeah so that is a town the size of carlisle harrogate so a big town and what i've started talking about to my teams is this this town called 13. you know and we've got this really special role in looking after this town called 13 with seventy three thousand people you know how how do we deliver the best possible houses for them how do we deliver the best possible repair service. We support about 12,000 people a year through our support services. So we'll be looking after some of the people in that town. And it's it's that kind of visualization for me to say, look, you know, if in five years time, this town is a better place, you know, and we've got, we've got more biodiversity, you know, our homes are warmer, it costs less to live in them, the customers are happy. And I reflect on, you know, I, I talked about my mother passing away, my father passed away a few years after that. But I have these really warm memories of home. You know, getting home after school, mum cooking tea, cooking a slice, big slice of toast and getting told off because your tea was going to be about to be ready, putting butter on it, chatting to your mum about the, the day and that kind of warm feeling of home. And yeah. can we bring that to people? You know, and I'm I'm not bothered really, you know, at a point when I go where the people remember, you know, it, I was involved in this thing. But I want to be able to look back and be proud of what we've delivered for our customers. You know, and when I talk to the, the 1,500 people at 13, at some point we'll, we'll all go, go. We'll, we'll have all left. But if we can say we were part of a good thing, we, we, we delivered for our customers and this town called 13 became a better place and we enjoyed it while we did it, we had a bit of crack while we were doing it, that's enough for me. I think we've got to finish there. I think that's a, a lovely way to finish. And um, I'm really excited about seeing where your journey goes because I think it's uh, it's nice to have new thoughts and slightly different perspective on thinking in our sector. And uh, I, I obviously wish you well at 13. I think you've got a great thing going on up there. And uh, and, and I look forward to getting you back on in the future and seeing, and seeing where this journey goes for you. But I um, appreciate your time and, and thank you for coming on the pod. Thanks, James. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk. You talk to me in a, a little while. I'll probably pull my hair out. But <laughs> cheers, the, ambition, mate. the ambition's all there. All right. Yeah, thanks. love it. Cheers, mate. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Hip. If you'd like to hear more from us, please be sure to follow us on your favourite podcast platform. We are also running a thirty-minute clinic free of charge to any clients that want to recruit in a more inclusive way. For more information, please reach out to us on our website, AndersonJames.com. 